Hi, everybody. Good evening. I want to make sure that you are able to see my screen. Can anybody give me a thumbs up seeing my screen? It looks good, Jennifer. I'm actually okay. logged in twice. So even, even on my normal login, I can see it. Okay, great. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Volume's good. Okay, thank you so much, Marsha, for the introduction and good evening, everybody. Uh, I promise you that that subtitle there says GEM, not GERM, um, but in, in all seriousness, it has been a doozy of a year, and I was so hoping to meet you all in person at this joint meeting this evening, but I'm really glad that we're able to meet virtually, and I so appreciate the invitation from Marsha to join you for this joint meeting. So this evening, I will provide an overview of the refuge at a glance, including its location on the landscape for those who might not be familiar, although I think most of you probably are. Some of the unique aspects of Patuxent, including a few of the management challenges at the refuge. I'll tell you a bit about the Fish and Wildlife Services Urban Initiative that's developed over the past decade or so and is now a major focus for Patuxent Refuge. And then I'll share some ideas of what you can expect to see when you visit each of the three tracks. Um, and we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. And some of the things to, to look out for when you visit would be in terms of habitat and wildlife, activities and trails, and closing with a bit of information about our our numerous volunteers and partner efforts. So for those who might not be familiar, again, I don't think very many of you have not visited, but we are located between Baltimore, Maryland and Washington, DC. Uh, we have three tracks on Patuxent Refuge covering close to 13,000 acres. Um, South Tract is in Prince George's County. That's where the National Wildlife Visitor Center is and my office is located there. The central tract, which was the original tract uh, where the research occurs, and that is not open to the public, and that straddles the county line between Prince George's and Anne Arundel. And then the north tract, which is actually the largest, um, which is all entirely in Anne Arundel County. There are two public entrances to Patuxent, um, one off of Route 197 at part of Powder Mill Road, going into the south tract, and the other off of Route 198, going to Bald Eagle Drive, which takes you to the North Track Information Station. So some of the unique aspects of Patuxent Refuge, um, most importantly, it, was, it is the only wildlife refuge in the system that was established primarily for the purpose of wildlife related research. It was designated in 1936 by FDR for that purpose. So it's unique in that regard. Another unique aspect is the fact that a large portion of our acreage, eight th around 8,000 acres, um, came from Department of Defense back in 1991. It was part of a military land transfer from Fort Meade to Department of the Interior. And as part of that transfer, we inherited, Fish and Wildlife Service inherited um, 13 active firing ranges and the possibility of unexploded ordnance on a large portion of that acreage. There are two major utility rights away that cross through the refuge, one um, PEPCO and one BGE. There's one high hazard dam at Cache Lake um, near Route 197 overpass there. 50 impoundments on the refuge, over 80 miles of roads and trails. Um, one of in the Department of the Interior's largest visitor centers. Um, a number of historic structures, especially on the central track of the refuge and unique in the fact that we are very close to Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters, which um, brings some impromptu, sometimes visits from high ranking officials. So all of these things on the screen that you see combined to present uh, a management challenge um, in running a public facility, throw a, a global pandemic in the mix and it, it's made for a um, very interesting first year uh, for me there. Um, visitation has been up um, over 200% uh, 
during the pandemic, which is a good thing, really. People have been looking for something free and nearby and um, safe to do and recreating outside is, is one of those things. So we're happy to have many more visitors, many of whom are new. And I'm surprised every day at the number of people I talk to both inside the visitor center and out on the trails who say, I've lived in the Laurel Bowie area for 30 years and I never knew this was here. So we're out to change that. So we are an urban refuge. Um, how do we define urban? Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service defines that as within 25 miles of a population center of 250,000 people or more. We are one of over 100 now er designated urban refuges across the United States. And that really spawned an interest on the part of the Fish and Wildlife Service in making the most of these urban places for for wildlife refuges and inspired the creation of something called the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program or UWCP. Um, the goals of that program are twofold, to inspire the next generation of outdoor enthusiasts in those high population areas. And secondly, to identify and address barriers and improve access to the outdoors. You can see here in the picture, um, working with some students from Bowie State University, that's Diana Ogilvie there in the center. Many of you probably know Ranger Diana. So the UWCP established some standards and these are standards to which urban refuges aspire. Um, I'm not gonna read them all, but you can see the, the range of things here. They're really about knowing and relating the community building partnerships, being a true community asset, um, ensuring long-term resources, equitable access for people, being a model of sustainability. Um, all of these things, if done successfully on an urban refuge, qualify it for designation as what's called a flagship urban refuge, which can come with the potential for enhanced funding and staffing capacity. And you'll see the second standard here, connect people with nature via stepping stones of engagement. And I'll point that one out because I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. So in addition to urban standards of excellence, um, they are encouraging urban refuges to really come up with our own kind of personalized vision for what we wanna do in our community. So we've crafted this one over the past year together, Jason Congelosi, who is our um, relative, he started around when I did, so he's also relatively new, um, the visitor services manager and I, with input from a number of partners, crafted this vision for Patuxent as really an urban leader in our community. And the vision is really threefold, to include, invite, and inspire people to connect with their nearby nature, through community-focused conservation. And I mentioned the stepping stones of engagement. And these really pertain to those three steps of include, invite, and inspire. So our plan to becoming a flagship refuge at Patuxent will focus on ways to include people, first and foremost, by offering them the familiar, familiar things like taking a walk, enjoying a meal together outdoors welcome them in, include them, and then invite them to try some new things, a little bit outside the familiar comfort zone, new things like guided cycling, birding excursions, um, making it easy to try things like fishing and hunting by offering uh, use of gear, um, mentored hunt programs. So inviting them to try new things and hopefully um, if we're fully successful, then we inspire them to engage in citizen science activities, to become part of the birding community, to um, become part of the hunting, fishing community, um, and take some of these things up on their own and, and pass them along to their families. So it's really about welcoming everyone in to Patuxent and inspiring them when they go back out into nature, whether it's on our refuge or other places. Um, I'll point out that one essential component of this is decreasing access barriers. Um, access barriers to those can include things like transportation, 
access to gear, access to information, um, access to mentors. So I'm gonna shift gears here. That's a little bit about the urban focus that we are really um, pushing for. I'm gonna switch gears and talk about habitat and critters. So habitat on the refuge is primarily forest. Uh, over 8,000 acres are in upland hardwood with a little over 2,000 acres. Um, oops, I skipped down a slide. I'm gonna go back, oh dear. Hang on. I gotta read, oh dear. All right, hang on, sorry folks. Hit one too many buttons. Skip through a few here to the habitat slide. Okay, so primarily forest on the refuge with some grassland habitat, um, some very nice savannas on the refuge, especially under the um, those utility rights away that I mentioned, and a bit of scrub shrub habitat as well. There's some very mature forests located on the central tract of the refuge along the Patuxent River corridor. And altogether, the Fish and Wildlife Service land holdings, along with a number of other federal partners in the area, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, um, forested area still left on Fort Meade, um, NASA Goddard, um, all of that chunk of federal land holdings makes up about 26,000 acres of what's sometimes referred to as the green lung of the DC corridor. So shifting from habitat to wildlife supported by those habitats and the thing that I know this group is passionate about, um, birds, first and foremost, over 270 species now, the official count on the refuge, um, 220 species of those reported on eBird. Um, a good number, over 100 different species of dragonflies and damselflies present on the refuge and documented. Uh, nearly 50 species of reptiles and amphibians, 35 species of mammals, and 30 species of fish. And I'll note that um, today and tomorrow, really all of this week, um, refuge biologist Sandy Spencer has been out in the Patuxent River with um, state biologists from Maryland DNR the state zoologist was there today and they have been doing mussel surveys um, looking for the yellow lance, which is endangered, but they've found some other um, Eastern elliptio, a couple other, they found lots of mussels, a couple um, new species that they didn't know were there before, along with some darter, um, some new darter species documented um, in the Patuxent. So very exciting uh, species documentation going on this week. So a little bit more about the bird life. Um, what can you expect to see in summer? Um, I see outside my office window, um, really enjoy watching the, the green herons, um, great blue herons, egrets, um, a number of wading birds um, fishing uh, along the edge of Lake Reddington. In the fall and spring, there are a number of migrant thrushes and warblers. In the winter months, you can expect to see a wide variety of waterfowl um, several sparrow species, including American tree sparrow, swamp sparrow, savanna sparrow, uh, rusty blackbirds along the lake shores. Um, some other notable bird life that you'll encounter on Patuxent are breeding populations of wild turkey. They greet me every morning as I drive in um, Scarlet Tanager Loop. Um, breeding populations of bald eagle, osprey, wood duck, hooded mergansers, green heron, pileated woodpecker, um, warbling vireos, willow flycatchers, and as I mentioned, several of the swallow species. Activities and trails that you can expect to find on the Tuxent Refuge. Um, traditionally, what we call the big six, the big six public uses, um, those being hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, and photography along with environmental education and interpretation. That has been the kind of the bread and butter of the refuge system for a very long time. Um, it's being looked at now um, with an eye toward 
maybe opening that definition up to some other ways of enjoying nature. Um, nature journaling, um, things like doing yoga outdoors, um, horseback riding, which is actually allowed on portions of the North Track. So there are a number of, of kind of new uses. Um, E-bikes e um, is something that um, those are allowed wherever bikes, regular bikes are allowed. So um, I think the big six is, is likely to expand. Um, we have over 20 miles of trails on the refuge. Five miles of those are on the south track and 17 miles on the north track. Uh, trails range from single track, mulched track to old gravel roads. Hiking is allowed on all of them. Um, bike riding and horseback riding are allowed on some of the trails on the north track for the refuge. We have a, a number of different activities. And I'll cover those more in a minute. Um, you can see the girl there who caught the fish. That was um, in July, we had a youth fishing event um, in conjunction with uh, Latino Conservation Week. And she caught her first fish there at Lake Reddington. Lake Reddington is not usually open to fishing, but we do use it for um, youth fishing events. And we have youth fishing gear available now in the visitor center to make it easy for families to, to try it out with their kids. There are a number of different programs and events that our visitor services team works really hard on, um, offered year round. Of course, a lot of these have been curtailed over the past year due to um, capacity restrictions indoors, um, COVID um, safety protocols um, from the Department of the Interior, but we're getting back into those as much as we safely can. Um, abiding by those those public health protocols and the and the capacity limits and social distancing both indoors and outdoors. Um, but the the regular in a regular year, uh, the sort of programs that we like to hold are there's a dragonfly hunt, um, a number of different night hikes um, led by rangers, especially at popular on the north track. Uh, photo scavenger hunts, bicycle tours, merit badge programs. We do a lot of work with scouts. Uh, wetland walks, live birds of prey talks, and a number of different virtual programs hosted as well. Uh, events throughout the year, a winter bird count held in January, you're probably familiar with that one. A youth fishing day typically held the first weekend in June. Um, we had an, a very well attended uh, event mid-July this summer. Um, it was our brief respite from, from uh, a lot of the masking mandates uh, mid-July, we were able to have a nice event uh, for Latino Conservation Week um, and we called it Bird Fest and it, and it was wonderful. Um, Outdoor Living Skills Day is coming up um, in conjunction with uh, REI Outfitters. Jason has arranged with them to teach some kind of basic camping skills for folks who are interested. Uh, traditionally, the Friends of Patuxent has held a pollinator festival in September. Um, they've decided to cancel that this year due to the, the rise in, in COVID numbers. Um, hopefully, they'll get back to that next fall. Refuge Conservation Day is held in October. We are planning to hold that again on October 2nd, as we did last year, um, with a number of outdoor and sign-up activities. And then the Friends of Patuxent Holiday Bazaar in Note typically held in November. So the National Wildlife Visitor Center on South Tract um, has a number of exhibits. If you haven't been in, we did reopen the visitor center, thankfully in June, June 1st, we reopened after having been closed for 15 months. Um, my whole first year plus in the building, it was very quiet inside, very busy outside. So it was great to reopen. Um, a lot of the exhibits are fairly dated. They date back to the early 90s when the building was constructed and focus on wildlife research, migration, habitats, endangered species, and life cycles of, um, of wildlife that is present not just in Maryland or in the Patuxent region, but across the nation. So if we are recognized as a, an urban flagship refuge and, and get some increased funding, one of the things that um, I'm interested in, along with our visitor services team, is to change up, refresh the exhibits in the building, um, focusing more on local community 
aspects, things like the Patuxent River, the Patuxent landscape, um, indigenous settlers along that river, and then unifying things like pollinators and migratory birds, really with an emphasis on storytelling and kind of making it real, um, more use of a visual medium, um, fewer things that require touch activated controls. A little bit more about what's inside the visitor center. Um, the front desk is run by volunteers pretty much, and I'll talk more about volunteers in a minute, um, but they've been really critical to welcoming people in at the front desk. There's a very nice uh, art gallery hallway, which houses rotating art and photography exhibits. There's a very nice indoor viewing area um, with views of Lake Reddington. A uh, very large auditorium, which is um, has been very underutilized, this especially this past year, and it's something that I'd really like to get back to and host some um, film, some different film festivals and that sort of thing. I think there's a lot more we could do with that auditorium. Um, a number of meeting rooms, uh, the Wildlife Images Bookstore, uh, kind of a nature shop um, that's also being staffed. Um, Ann Carlson is the new bookstore manager and she's um, really revamping the sorts of things that are available in the bookstore. Um, so that's, that's another exciting area of change. Um, restrooms, of course, um, inside. And I'm happy to announce that we are adding a, a new comfort station that will be near the main entrance of the visitor center. Um, near the entrance to the Discovery Trailhead, if you're familiar with that. So as you approach the visitor center to, in the parking lot to the left side, um, that the materials for that are, giving, are being delivered next week. And so that should be coming soon. Um, there's a nice native plant pollinator garden out front, and we've added some container pollinator gardens on the back patio. Um, there's a bird feeding station with benches, and we've also enhanced the back patio we had to make the most with the outdoor space we had because indoors was closed for so long. So I saw that back patio, it was pretty overgrown. Um, we've really cut back a lot of the vegetation so you can see the lake again from standing on the patio. We added um, some shade sails for shade back there, um, new scopes, uh, several metal tables where you can actually sit and do some journaling or um, just have a conversation. Um, so it's really a pleasant place to be, again, on the back patio. If you haven't visited and checked that out, um, I'd encourage you to do so. I'll shift gears again, a little bit about our environmental education and interpretation that is offered. Um, we work with a number of school groups in the Laurel and Bowie communities already. I'm looking to expand that. Um, we work with groups that are interested in learning about schoolyard habitats and conservation landscaping and putting those into practice um, either in their backyards or in their HOA or um, at their church, um, whatever their organization might be. Um, public, a number of different public programs available for children of all ages. Uh, I mentioned a number of the special events that are held year round, working with scouts as you see here on this slide and the seasonal tram tours around um, the tram loop, uh, very popular. We had to suspend those during COVID. We've not started them back up again yet, um, looking for a safe way to do that and um, to get a driver, um, importantly. Shifting to the Central Tract. So all of that was on South Tract at the National Wildlife Visitor Center. Central Tract is where the research has always occurred. I know Matt, for one, is, is very familiar with um, the activities there on the Central Tract. Um, original acreage there, 2,670 acres, was, that's what was first designated in 1936. That was Patuxent Refuge um, before its expansion on the south and north sides. Um, the Eastern Ecological Science Center of U the United States Geological Survey, our sister agency in Interior, is running um, a number of programs there on the central tract. We have a memorandum of understanding between Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS, and they um, occupy space in a number of the buildings there and run the bird banding lab, as well as a, a pollinator laboratory. The bee, you've probably heard it referred to as the bee lab. 
on the central track. A number of contaminant studies are conducted there on the central track to the refuge. Um, that's where a lot of the captive propagation techniques um, were pioneered. And that section of the refuge is not open to the public. Um, that's really where the, the research takes place. And so it, it is not open to the public. There are a number of folks who have special use permits um, working with a refuge biologist on those to conduct research of different sorts. And Sandy does an excellent job keeping track of all of that. On the North Tract, um, the, newest, the newest acquisition and the biggest, over 8,000 acres, as I mentioned, transferred from DOD, which quadrupled the size of Patuxent Refuge, added a lot of important habitat, um, opportunities for wildlife observation, hiking, hunting, fishing, biking, and horseback riding, which I was kind of surprised to find um, when I started there. And there's a very active group, another group. Um, Bert, you have a birders group, and there is a, an active group called uh, Trail Riders of Tomorrow, TROT, um, which has like 500 members in the area um, who are horseback riding enthusiasts and um, enjoy bringing their horses to the refuge to ride. There is a smaller visitor information station at the entrance to the North Track that does offer restrooms and um, a few small exhibits in there and um, opportunity to interact with the ranger, get a trail map. Um, sign in is required for visitors to the North Track because of that unexploded ordinance potential that I mentioned earlier that, that was uh, a relic of the, the DOD land transfer. So this photo here is um, last winter, we hosted the first ever mentored hunt on Patuxent. It was very successful. We had um, 10 mentors and 12 mentees paired up with them. Um, two of the first time hunters, and so this was oriented toward people who had never tried hunting before. Um, they started with deer. Some of them then um, continued to go with their mentors and, and hunted for waterfowl. Two of the mentees did harvest deer during the deer season. Um, we got very good feedback on it and we're gonna be doing it again this winter um, and possibly also offering a diversity hunt as well as a, a mentored hunt for new hunters. Shifting gears again, talking a little bit about some of the habitat management um, that we deal with on Patuxent. Um, several big categories, impoundments for moist soil management, meadow management, scrub shrub, and control of invasives. So the, the moist soil dependent um, species, things like shorebirds, waterfowl, and a number of fish populations depend on uh, manipulation of those impoundments, um, making sure that that habitat is available for them, especially during crucial portions of their life cycle. Um, mowing is constantly an issue uh, for managing meadow habitat to promote warm, um, native warm season grasses and species like milkweed, um, important for pollinators, um, feeding fields for bats and birds. Um, so mowing, um, timing of mowing and, and where we mow and don't mow um, is a very sensitive issue between um, our maintenance staff and the refuge biologist. So that's something that, that's a, an ongoing conversation about mow or don't mow. Um, scrub shrub habitat, especially under those power line rights of way um, and at the old shooting ranges on the refuge. Um, and in control of invasive species. Some of the species that we are battling include Korean Lespedisa, that's rampant across the refuge, very difficult to control. Um, Japanese stilt grass is another one, mile a minute weed, garlic mustard, um, and a new one last year, uh, wavy leaf basket grass showed up on the North Tract. And those seeds are very, they're like sticky little burrs that are easily transported by hikers on their, their pants, um, hunters on their boots, um, and wildlife, of course, wildlife themselves. And last but certainly not least, um, essential to the functioning of Patuxent Refuge are the huge army of volunteers. We've got over 200 volunteers that provide over 25,000 hours of service per year in a typical year. Again, that was down last year, um, but it was not a typical year. And 
they cover a number of different activities for us. Um, a lot in the area of visitor services. As I mentioned, they staff the front door, front lobby of the visitor center. Um, we have folks doing community science, um, gardening and landscaping, um, helping with facility maintenance, trail maintenance. Um, we do have a volunteer appreciation picnic and dinner each year. And if you're interested in volunteering and haven't done that before, you can contact Ranger Diana Ogilvie. Her number's on the screen. Um, and I will mention that Diana has been awarded with a, a major, if you hadn't heard, Diana Ogilvie is being honored on Thursday of this week by our North Atlantic Regional Office as the Visitor Services Professional of the Year for the entire North Atlantic region. So we are very excited um, for her being recognized. It is very well deserved. Diana's amazing. So volunteers are an important part of the equation as are of course our numerous partners. And I've worked really hard over this first year to build partnerships and we're gonna to continue to do this. So we have, you can see the, the names on the screen here. I'll point out a few of the newest ones, um, Hispanic Access Foundation, um, next to that Defensores de la Cuenca, um, Mobilize Green under that. On um, the left side of the screen, Environment for the Americas is another one that we partnered with this year. Um, we worked with them to, and the Defensores group to sponsor 30 um, young students from Laurel for online bird camp last fall and winter when um, a lot of students were being homeschooled and parents and educators were scrambling for some new good online content. Um, we partnered with Environment for the Americas that was hosting this online bird camp, um, but it had a tuition fee. So we went to Defensores, which is the local group, and they kind of helped us match up scholarships with students who were interested in, and the refuge sponsored them to attend the online bird camp. So that was a fun thing this year. Um, REI, I mentioned Jason is working with them. Um, they're really interested in doing some outdoor skills classes with us. Um, for very inexpensive uh, for the refuge. And then what's really neat is that they wanna donate the equipment after they're done. Um, Latino Outdoors is another new one. Outdoor Afro, we're working with both of them to help recruit um, new hunters for the, some of the um, mentored hunts. And Bowie State University is really, I think a, an unexplored um, partner and one that I'd like to really create a more formalized partnership with. So just a few big takeaways, um, things that I really am prioritizing for the coming year. And those are connecting more tightly with our local community. And by local, I mean, not going so far as DC and Baltimore, but Laurel, South Laurel, Bowie, Greenbelt, um, Beltsville, that's kind of our zone. Um, strengthening partnerships with local groups in those areas, and then really thinking about how we can best enhance visitor experiences across the board. And so if you have ideas for how we can do that, um, things that you would like to see, um, enhancements for, for your experience as the birding community, um, I would love to hear about those. Um, you can email me, my email's there on the screen. Um, give me a call um, or put your hand up right now and, and let's talk about it. I think we have a, a bit of time for some questions. Is that right, Marsha? Yes, it is. We have plenty of time. And we do have a little um, movie here. I'm not sure if this will work, but I guess we can try it. Your sound. Yeah, the sound isn't working, but you can see the. These are all pictures that I took over the last 15 months on the refuge.
that was the back patio. Monarch, Monarch tagging and release has been really popular. That's again, the shade sale over the back patio. Um, that's the bird fest. Um, they did kind of introductory birding, identification and just how to use binoculars. And you see that boy's face when you saw the Monarch released, Pre precious. Um, chalk art, last October. The horses, the firing ranges, tagged monarchs ready for release, and that's it. I have a question. Yes. Has the roads at the north track been improved? Yes. Great. No big potholes. This summer, the maintenance crew worked really hard. We finally got the funds. And um, it was supposed to happen the summer before, but um, COVID put a put a damper on a lot of supplies um, and we couldn't get the contracts in place. But this summer that work has occurred. The roads are unbelievably better. So come and check it out. Great. And we are hoping to, uh, once we can fully get going with bird walks and field trips for the bird club, we are hoping to have some guided field trips to North Tract as well as South Tract. That'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we can, um, you now we're doing, we're doing night hikes even, even now, even last summer, we did night hikes with sign up. You know, we had online sign up and kind of restricted the group size to about 15, you know, with plus the ranger. And, and that worked out really well. So it's, it's doable and safe. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer, oh, let me turn my video on. Jennifer, with respect to the hikes that we're planning, should we contact you first or, because uh, generally I just sort of schedule my dates and I was planning four of them, uh, uh, you know, on behalf of the bird clubs. How do you want us to coordinate? You can just send me an email and I'll, I'll make sure that our visitor services, um, like the Jason's aware of that. Um, okay. if, you'd, if you'd like us to help promote it on the refuge social media, we can do that. Or if you'd rather us not, you know, just advise us of that. If we can be helpful in that way, we're happy to do so. Um, if you want to mm -hmm. have all the handle the sign up and, and do all of that your, yourselves, and it's just more of an FYI for us, that's fine too. The other uh, thing that certainly came up uh, listening to your talk was uh, would the refuge be able to coordinate with the Hispanic groups for uh, us to lead a bird walk for the Hispanic groups, even though we might not have a Spanish speaker? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And we could probably find an intern um, who could interpret. Um, Latino Outdoors has a number of interns, so does Hispanic Access Foundation. Um, we've partnered with both of them and they, they often have um, student interns throughout the year who would love to participate in something like that. And, and they all came out on July 17th for our event. And we had um, Spanish speakers at every state, every activity station had at least one Spanish speaker at it. So that would be, I think that's a great idea. Thank you. I have three uh, things about the refuge, uh, which have been bothering me for the past uh, uh, one for maybe the last four years, the other for the past seven since I moved to uh, uh, Maryland. For the past five years, the that tree in front of the uh, Walmart blind has made it almost useless. Uh, and uh, it would be great if you could cut that tree down. Uh, in front of which blind? The Walmart blind, the one at the end of the bo boardwalk. Okay. By the way, your new blind is fantastic. I have incredible photos from there. Great. Uh, uh, for the past seven years, However, we'll go to uh, the new priorities from the Department of Interior to open up more of the refuges to hunters and fishermen that came out from 
high up there. Perhaps you could open it up more also to uh, uh, bird watchers by opening the road around Redding Lake. That would be really, uh, you know, more public access. So tram loop road, making that accessible. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we, we, that we did a little bit of a pilot of that last um, October 2nd on the, or on our urban celebration day and people loved yeah. it. It's a really nice two mile loop. It's, it's nearly impossible to get lost. Um, it has a known start and finish. So people, and it's wide, you know, people, yes. Some people don't want to hike on a on a skinny trail. They they like you know that comfort of the width. So it has a lot of appeal. Um, you know, back in there, I think it would need to be somewhat seasonally sensitive because there are a lot of wintering waterfall I, back I in there that use that as refuge um, habitat. So I'm I'm I'd really like to figure out a, a schedule to make that work. Um, we're going to open it again this year on October 9th, which is take a walk on the wild side day. Um, so it, that will be open on Saturday, October 9th again, but yeah, I'd like to start having, you know, playing around with, you know, whether it's one day a month to start and, and just see how we do as far as litter and, um, disturbing wildlife. Take it, take it. Understood. That's enough for me. I've talked enough, so I'm going to just shut up and not make my other request good good no i send me an email but those are those are great ideas so i appreciate that, that. thanks ken you're welcome jennifer dave mazurkowicz had a question about research and the refuge's role in the research mission dave did you want to speak your question you're muted if you wanted to talk well, maybe he stepped away. The, what he wrote in the chat is, although it covers only a small fraction of the refuge, um, oh, he doesn't have a microphone. The real gem here is its long history of research. What is the refuge doing to maintain and enhance that important work? So maybe you could, you could describe the relationship with USGS. Sure, yeah. Um... Tom O'Connell, who's the director of the Eastern Ecological Science Center, and I started around the same time, and we've known each other from past work um, on Chesapeake Bay and fisheries. So that was just kind of, we both surprised one another. We showed up around the same time and have a good, really good working relationship. So Tom and I meet monthly and trying to come up with some really good ways that Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS can work together to advance science priorities for the department. So pollinator science is a big one. Um, migratory birds and the the bird the work of the bird banding lab and supporting that. Um, in terms of visibility, you know we have a nice visitor center on the South Tract and they're doing great work at the bird banding lab, but people don't really know about it. So um, that's an that's an idea we had where you know we have something that they want, which is visibility, um, and doing some more bird banding like bird banding demos. Um, on the South Tract where people can actually come in and getting USGS folks, scientists involved in some of that outreach work. Um, so those were a couple um, uh, invasive species control, different control methods for Lespedeza. We're, we're working on that actively. Um, there are a number of different special use permittees um, working with Sandy on a number of different um, population population of I'm trying to think of what the species are in addition to the the mussel surveys that are going on now that I mentioned um, for yellow lance so those are a few of the that jump to mind um, birds bats pollinators mussels um, it would actually be a good thing for the refuge to find another threatened or endangered species or two <laughs> on the refuge um that would be leverage for some certain big projects let's say so um surveys for those thanks um jennifer i, I want to give a shout out to the friends of patuxent uh partnership project that we have with um tim parker at the refuge we're developing um 
an outdoor, a new enhanced um, outdoor exhibit area that's going to be named in honor of Chan Robbins. Um, we wanted to keep Chan Robbins' memory and what he meant to Patuxent Research Refuge alive. So the existing pavilion, that is the outdoor education pavilion used for children's programs, is going to be renamed in honor of Chan. And we're developing um, a trail that will lead up to that. Nobody even knows where this thing is because it's tucked back in the woods um, near the visitor center, but not right adjacent to it. You have to walk across a field and then into the woods to get to this little pavilion. It's not on a public trail right now, but we're developing a public trail that's going to lead up to it. And there's going to be some activity stations along the trail, such as a listening station and a viewing station with some um, cutouts of birds planted in the trees so that people can have practice looking and listening for birds and you know interpretive uh, signage along the way so we're all those of us who are working on it are really excited about this opportunity and we're really grateful to the refuge staff for working on this with us we think it's really going to be a nice enhancement yeah i can't wait to experience it and i know tim's really excited about it and um glad to see those plans coming along and, and having the the sound aspect is is definitely um unique um and i would like to make it you know a feature and draw draw people over to the the entrance to it um thinking about maybe some picnic tables under those that group of pine trees that's up on the the hill there just as you approach the employee parking area Mm -hmm. um, maybe making a break in that split rail fence that, to make it, you know, welcoming for people to come in and have the shade of the pines and then have some sort of signage there pointing the way to where the Chan Robbins Trail begins. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to Dave's other, Dave's question about science. I forgot, I neglected to mention climate resilience. So that's a big, so from the department, that's a huge priority that USGS and the Fish and Wildlife Service share um, an interest in. So impacts of climate change on, on birds, on bees. Um, and we have a, a really nice, you know, we have 13,000 acres of green between two big cities in which to, you know, look at those sorts of impacts of, of climate change on species. So that's another big area of science focus for us. And you know, Jennifer has been um, referring to the Research Center as the Eastern Ecological Science Center. I just want to remind everybody that the former Patuxent Wildlife Research Center was renamed last year. So that's the new name. And there will soon be a new sign at um, Powder Mill and 197 that um, says as much, that says Eastern Ecological Science Center one way and um, Patuxent um, refuge visitor center the other way so yeah we're working on signage improvements across the refuge not just at that intersection but um, on all of the north track trails and roads um, just to be clearer about what's allowed you know I, I'm sensitive to sign clutter but I really think and tell me if I'm wrong but I think visitors appreciate reduced uncertainty about what's allowed where and when so especially during hunting season and you know, we've got places where bow hunting is allowed and people are walking by on a hike and kids are riding bikes and it kind of blows my mind the number of different uses that are in proximity to one another. So I'm I'm really interested in making it very clear <laughs> to people. Um, so watch for the new signs and, and tell me what you think. Um, we'll be interested to see if they work. With respect to uh, signage, the uh, uh, Parks and Planning sent some of their proposed signs out to uh, a couple of the bird clubs for comments and we made them. Uh, they were very surprised that our comments favored putting forth the rules very clearly. Uh, but feel free, you know, if you've got a uh, design out, you know, to send it to Marsha, send it to me, send it to uh, Friends of Patuxent and get some comments on it. Uh, you'll find your consumers are uh, 
very aware of that, ha have opinions and could be helpful. Good suggestion. Yeah, Tim's got a mock-up. We're using the universal recreation symbols. So like binoculars, um, the guy with the rifle, or I shouldn't say guy, um, person with a rifle, the angling sign. So the, the trying to get away from words, using the symbols that are universal um, symbol is either, you know, this is this is okay to do now, or if it has a line through it, it's not okay to do now. So we're really trying to go that direction. Um, I saw another, I think there was a question about neurotoxins. I saw it pop on the screen a minute. There, there, I'll read it to you. It just came up. Is there, this is Elizabeth Walker asking, is there any research at the refuge on the effects of neurotoxins like permethrin that area towns are applying as aerosols to mitigate mosquitoes? Um, mm -hmm. Effects of these on birds, butterflies, dragonflies, etc. Larvicides seem to be more effective and much safer but the Maryland Department of Agriculture recommends the insecticides instead. That was my question. They just sprayed Greenbelt um, last week, and now they're doing three more sprays this week. Mm -hmm. wow. And um, we, we saw an enormous decrease in um, arthropods, in, in um, butterflies and dragonflies and all sorts of things. And the birds don't seem to be as, as prevalent. Uh, it, it seems to have had a very negative effect. That's a great question. I will, um, I suspect that there probably are some studies on the USGS side um, because they have researchers who work on, on uh, chemical contaminant impacts. So I suspect the answer is yes, but I, I will look into that. I can't say for sure. The insecticides seem to breed mosquitoes that are, that are resistant, so, so it worsens the problem. Mm. The larvicides do a really good job, but they're more expensive, and it's very complicated to get the wetland permissions to use them. Um, but it looks as if um, the larvicides are much safer for the long-term use. I'm making notes. I used to be able to opt out, but now they've got a clause that says you can't opt out of something like West Nile's found. So. Mm. We tried to opt out, but we couldn't. Elizabeth, I live in uh, Greenbelt as well. I'm curious who who who's in charge of the spraying. Who who Greenbelt tried to opt out, and who? No, no, no Greenbelt signed up with the University of Maryland's Department. The agriculture and once you're, you've signed up for it then you can't opt out until the following year so now we're locked into it and um th nobody did any research i imagine it's such a complicated problem but it, it permethrin is ba banished in canada restricted for use in the european union um california i think is banned it, it it's bad stuff it, it's half life is 17 days so it's around for a, you know quarter of the year and then they do it again and um it's toxic, toxic to bees, and it's toxic to cats, and it's toxic to fish, and it, it seems to depress the other animals I talked about. So, I see Helen's on, um, which brings to mind plant survey, the native plant uh, survey, and and collection effort for seeds and and plant specimens. So that's that's another area where the refuge has been and continues to be supportive of science. Um, the herbarium, um, relocating the herbarium to its own special room in the, in the main visitor center um, down off the lobby. That wasn't something that took place over this past year. So we got it out of um, what, it, what was intended to be temporary housing for the herbarium at the North Track contact station and, and into a, a better long-term location for it with a little more room um, for the folks working on working with the plants. I, th I think the amazing thing about the toxin um, that your talk really brought home, Jennifer, is that there's so much that goes on there and yeah. a lot of it isn't visible to the public. So it's, it's really hard to know 
um, unless you're actively engaged in it yourself, it's hard to know what's going on. There, you're absolutely right. It's um, it's been a steep learning curve for me, and I'm still learning every day. And no day is like another. And there's always these things that come out of complete left field, like wow, I didn't I didn't know we did that here. So it's I'm still learning. But you're right. It's a it's an enormous um, spectrum of things that happen in in what is a very special place. So feel really lucky to be there. I encourage you all to come and visit if you haven't been recently. Um, autumn is certainly a wonderful time to visit. So come on out and um, let us know what you think. You've got the best work location in Prince George's County, I think. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any more questions for Jennifer or questions in general for either bird club? Jennifer, this is Matt Perry. I got a, uh, a question in regard to uh, the management. Uh, you know, in the past, we always talked about uh, any activities on the refuge had to be compatible with wildlife. And that long list you had of activities and increasing activities, I wonder if that's changed because of the urban status now. No. Um activities still need to be compatible. So I need to do a compatible appropriate appropriateness finding and compatibility determination for activities that, um, especially if they fall outside the big, I mean, the big six are, those are appropriate and compatible kind of by definition, but if it's outside of those big six, so that's what I was alluding to is I think that that bucket of six things that are sort of you know, ingrained as those are okay on a refuge, that that bucket is being challenged, you know, what's in there is as accepted, that's being challenged all the time. And, um, but the the finding of appropriateness and compatibility um, standard is still very much in place. Good. I, I remember uh, when we were doing the uh, compatibility, uh, the comprehensive plan, I mean, uh, one of the big issues was the uh, horses on the north track. Yeah. And also, uh, because of their droppings, possibly bringing in exotic species and that argument. But then the argument with bicycles also was brought in, you know, if it's a, a birding trip on bicycles, but most of it's physical exercise. It's not really related to wildlife. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but it's just uh, it making seems that like it gets a little fuzzy it. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and even, you know, we're, we're going to be offering, um, uh, introduction to, to kayaking on October 2nd on Cache Lake wow. um, with an outfitter. We've, we've arranged with a kayak outfitter um, to offer, and this is groups and it's by sign up. And, um, but, you know, people do like to fish from kayaks and, and look and observe bird life from kayaks. And so it's a, uh, it's, again, it's those stepping stones to engagement. So, you know, you have right. to, you know, teach them about kayaking first if, if they're going to possibly fish from a kayak. So it's, you know, baby steps. Right. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Well, so I, I have a question that maybe I have a comment also. I appreciate your talk. It was very cool, uh, especially seeing this urban connection thing. I'm a, I'm a soil scientist at Bellsville Ag Research Center and also a bird watcher. And I, when I moved here a little more than 20 years ago, there was concern expressed that Boyk could be sold off. And it's been going on since I've been here. And when the new director came in a few years ago, he said, well, you know, the new president is a real estate agent. Maybe he wants to sell the place off. How do we keep the place? And I'm like, what? <laughs> thing, thing number one, but my, my, you know, there's always this threat of, of, of these 26,000 acres or portions of it being, you know, de-wilded or whatever, you know, and you guys are certainly wilder than we are, but we certainly have really good diversity of birds here too and other wildlife. So I, want, I mean, do you and Boyk work together much on these kinds of issues? And I know it's a complex issue that, um, so I just wonder if you could speak to any of that kind of thing in terms of preserving this 26,000 acres you know. Sure. Yep. Good. Great question. Um, yes, Dr. Zhang and I have been in touch. Um, Howard Zhang is the director there. 
he and I got in touch uh, shortly after I started, and it was really the maglev proposal that um, prompted our initial conversation, but we have been in touch on various things since that time. Um, I also just touched base with the folks at NASA Goddard. Um, so it, what, what's interesting is that the maglev proposal prompted federal, you know, between in, interagency communication on a level that probably hadn't been seen in quite some time. So all of a sudden we were all calling one another, like what, you know, how are you dealing with this and how's it going to impact your, your facility? And so what's nice is that those relationships, you know, we, we, we built them initially over a year ago and, and now they've led to some other connections. For instance, uh, my counterpart at the National Park Service is very active on the um, National Capital Planning Commission. I'm not typically involved in those meetings, but she is. She heard at one of those meetings that NASA Goddard has a chunk of 105 acres of darn nice forest that they want to divest of. And she said, would the refuge be interested? And I said, oh yeah, um, we need to go look at it first and see what's actually on that parcel, but it's it abuts the refuge so definitely. So it's, it's nice for us. So we're in touch with now on on that with NASA Goddard. I think the same would be true if, if there was any hint of bark, you know, downsizing, um, you know, they're our neighbor. And so, and Fort Meade, um, <laughs> Fort Meade is looking at, so we all kind of look out for one another. Um, we're sensitive to um, that, that green lung chunk that we all share a piece of and um, nobody wants to see it uh, carved up anymore and developed. Um, a little bit of a follow-up. Um, I know uh, people that are, I mean, one, one of the things I always tried to do here is get more people onto Boyk, just because no, it, it's kind of the same thing what you said, that people just don't know that we're here. They don't know what we do. They don't know how great our land is. You know, and I'm limited. I'm just a scientist here. I don't have any administrative duties, and I can get permits to get people to do bird counts and stuff like that. And at one point, they wanted to open up a... Uh, under a previous administration, a local administration, they wanted to actually open up an area where people could walk, you know, and come out. And that, that got nixed when that administration ended for all kinds of complex reasons, but whatever. Um, and then, so that always seems to me like a good thing to do and to get the local community. So I'm really glad that you guys are reaching out to the local communities more. And I'm kind of just kind of wondering if there's any way for Boink to piggyback on some of what you're doing or if we could collaborate again i'm not speaking as an official here i'm just kind of brainstorming you know and other people have commented that the only way to save boyk is to make it a national point you know so it's kind of that level of discussion and i often wonder if there's some future much bigger federal umbrella that could help and maybe your conversations you know could lead to, I, don't, I know this is big big time thinking that is probably unrealistic but anyway i'm just kind of brainstorming yeah so yeah to... well it, it's it's an interesting line of thought and you know the something that's come to my mind and i've discussed with tom o'connell is the relationship between pollinators and food production and the fact that we have you know bark as a next door neighbor and the bee lab is is on patuxent refuge you know that i think i think you know messaging um for our neighbors and the community about why that work is important for so food production and pollinators, you know, pretty important to everybody. And, and I don't think people generally get that. So I think, you know, as science based agencies, we haven't done a really good job of telling that story. Um, so as you know, as I look to make the revamp the um, exhibits in the visitor center, given that we again, we have a nice visitor center space that is open for people. And so to be able to weave in some of the messages that might help bark or might help even nasa got you know like i think there's there's room there for us to support one another in, in messaging i do also think that the word research is a put off for people um they see patuxent research refuge and they think that's not for me you know i'm not a researcher so it's it doesn't seem open like a publicly welcoming space. And I think the same is probably true for, for the name that's on Bark. Um, so that's, 
that's unfortunate, but that it goes with the, you know, the history of the place. It was designated originally for research. And so, you know, the, the mission has um, evolved over time, um, but we do have a great space where we can do a lot of good storytelling. So I, you know, we become a million dollar refuge. I, I would love to uh, work with my fellow federal neighbors on some messages that we could, you know, develop together. Uh, I really like your exhibit ideas. That was that was really neat. Years ago, Bark used to have I don't know when they had their last one, but they used to have like an open house or a day when the public came and learned about all the fascinating things that they do there. And I think that was a wonderful way to um, make people aware of what goes how important it is. Yeah, and we and yeah, and we we a lot of us think the same. That was cut because of budget cuts. All our budget comes for research, so we, we can't get away from the research, <laughs> Jennifer. But at the same time, we can make it more palatable. And um, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, the only the only way that 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 all these places are going to be saved is public support. You know, and I think yeah, that field day that we did, I thought was wonderful that way. Yeah. But at the same time, it didn't show the whole expanse of the land that we have. You know, it focused on on the research. It kind of you know had a kind of a lab. There was there was field, you know, I do field research, so th there was some field research components, but you know, a lot of it was lab based, so people didn't make the link between the research and the landscape as much. But yeah, no, I appreciate that, Bob. I think some of us are pushing to redo that, restart that. Well, also, I used to work for the Greenbelt News Review, and I always loved covering uh, the meetings, like they call it a work session when somebody from BARC would come and talk to the city council and I would cover the story because it was always of great interest to me. But I don't know how many other municipalities or groups they sent somebody out to do that with, but I thought that was a great um, outreach also. Greenbelt might have initiated that, but you might know better. Yeah. A quick question. What hours are the North Track open? North Track is open at 8 a.m. The gate opens at 8 a.m. Um, to 4 o'clock, 8 to 4. Every day? Um, not, uh, not during hunting season, though. Um, right. Which has started for a goose. Um, goose season is in now. I'll have to look back at my, I'm, I'm looking at my it. brain. One yeah. of my slides had the hours on there. I got to go back to that slide. I'm looking it up, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, South Track is sunrise to sunset. Um, the hours I have are just daily eight to four closed on federal holidays. Okay, that sounds right. So, so it is it is seven days a week. I know it's it's been a challenge um, at our current staffing levels to to staff the visitor center there on weekends, but we have to we have to have coverage because of the need for people to sign in. See, that's the difference between north and south is that south the grounds can be open and you don't need to sign in to go for a hike on south but you do you know we need somebody there checking people in on north thank you sure and jennifer that's mainly because of the unexplored north ordinance right right that's that's it's, the reason it, Well, if there aren't any further questions, I want to give Jennifer a hearty thank you. We all really very much enjoyed your talk and enjoyed learning much more about our refuge. I really have a sense of possessiveness about that refuge because it's right up the road. So it's a wonderful opportunity that we have right here in our community. And I'd like to see us all take more advantage of it. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for your introduction to us about the refuge. My pleasure. Thanks for the Great. invitation and have a good rest of your meeting. And I look forward to seeing you out on the refuge. Great. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Good, good night.
Good night, night everybody. And remember, fall count Saturday. Let Matt know. All righty. Good night, everybody.